All right, and good morning, everybody. Um, what a wonderful way to start off our, our service. Um, <clears throat> but I also have a, a heavy heart, as I know many of you guys do, for those that um, suffered the tragic losses in Maui this last, this last week. And um, I've continued to read about it and read this morning that the, the death toll is now up to 93. And um, huge loss of life, huge loss of uh, finances, resources, businesses, houses, um, just a devastation that's happened. And so we want to pray for them and we want to pray for the, the Christians who are boots on the on the ground there, that they would um, be encouraged themselves by the Lord, and that they would also be the hands and feet of Jesus. I know that uh, Harvest Ministries, uh, Greg Glory Harvest Crusade has a church there. I know there's a uh, Calvary Chapel there as well. Um, and so there, there's those believers that are there, and, I, and uh, Greg Glory shared this last week on uh, some posts that many of in the congregation there with Harvest that they lost both their, their houses and their jobs. Um, Lahaina was just devastated. And for any of you guys who have been there, I, I, I was there a number of times as a kid and, and for my honeymoon and just a, a beautiful, beautiful um, island, a beautiful area there, and just such a devastating loss. So let's just add another word of prayer for, for those that are suffering. God, we thank you that you are the God of all comfort and the Father of mercies. That we can come before you at any moment of the day or night, and you are not, you do not slumber, you do not sleep. There's no time that you're too busy for us. There's no time that you're away. There's no time that you tell us to wait. There's no time that you tell us that you don't want to hear us, God. And so we are so grateful for that. And so we just come before you with, with heavy hearts, knowing that so many have lost so much, that they have just been through devastation as there's been loss of life, loss of family members, loss of houses and businesses and finances, and the devastation is going to be felt for a long time to come. And God, I pray that you would use this Somehow, some way, we know you will, for your glory, for your purposes, God, that you would draw people to yourself in the midst of it, that um, as they see these things that are material things go up in smoke, that they would realize the thing that would never be taken away, and that is you, your spirit, God, that you are right there, that you are close to the brokenhearted, that you come and say to us, come all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, because my burden is easy and my yoke is light. And so, God, I pray that there would be those in Maui right now that would hear your voice, that they would be drawn to you. And God, we pray that you would encourage and build up the, the spirits of the believers that are already there, that you would give them a special and distinct ministry during this time, that they would be your hands and your feet, God, that they would provide in very real and authentic ways for those around them, and that you would provide for them, God, that they're in devastation as well. And so, God, I pray that you would increase your church during this time, that you would build up your church, that your church would advance, and we know it will because we know that you are the God who advances, God. And so, God, I pray for each one of them, and we pray that you would show us how we can be ministers of your grace and how we can be those hands and feet as well, how we can help out those that are suffering such loss. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we come here to our, our service, we're going to be continuing on in the book of Zechariah chapter 10. Um, we're looking at 12 little verses here today. And so you can open up in your Bibles there to chapter 10 of Zechariah. And we call this a purpose, participating in God's work. And that's, that is the ending goal of it. So there, you'll hear our response in things. And that response is that we have purpose. We have, we have a purpose in life. And that purpose is to participate in what God is doing. And so we'll hear some ways that we can do that. 
We're also going to hear here today about how it was leading forward to the great and perfect good shepherd that was to come in Jesus, and how through that, he's gathering people towards himself. And so in Zechariah, we see those that are returning from the Babylonian exile, and, and Zechariah is encouraging them and calling them to repent from their sins, to return to the Lord with their whole hearts and their whole lives. And there's lots of prophecies of Jesus in there. And we're in the last section of the book now, chapters 9 through 14. We started that last week. And in this section of the book, Zechariah is older now, and um, he has two prophetic or oracle sections of the book. We're in the first one, so chapters 9 through 11 is the first one. It's about the messianic king and the messianic shepherd, which we'll hear a lot about that shepherd here today. And then in the second section and last section, it's chapters 12 through 14, and that's talking really about God's justice, God bringing all things to a close and bringing that final judgment and justice and also about God's mercy, grace, and his spirit and the new Jerusalem. And so as we continue to look at this, let's think about some of the things that we have sang. We sang that God is, Father, let your kingdom come, let your will be done. That is what we want. That's what we desire, that you would have your kingdom come. We also sang that he is the way maker, He's the one that, that makes a way where you see no way. He's the promise keeper. He's the one that keeps all of his promises. And we hear about those promises. We heard about those promises the last couple weeks here. And we'll go some more here today. And he keeps those promises. We can know that once he says it, it will be accomplished. He is the miracle worker. He can cause miracles to happen. And so that's why we pray for EJ. That's why we pray for those that are others that are sick in our congregation. That's why we pray for the hurting and the broken, because he enters into that. That's why we pray for salvation, like Tabby said right, uh, right before us here, because that is the greatest miracle that there is, the turning of a heart that was going away from the Lord, turning it towards the Lord. What a greater miracle is there than that? to have one that was running from God to one that is running towards the Lord. And so we do believe in that. And we sing way in the darkness that God, that is who you are. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. Okay, and we need to believe that. And I was thinking about this as we were singing. Um, You look around you and you see some empty seats, pray for those empty seats. Pray for those that you know. Pray for those that you will get to know that will fill one of those empty seats. And it's not to fill an empty seat so we have more people here. It's to fill an empty seat because there's a soul that's running from the Lord, and we we're, we're want to be those ambassadors to help to call that soul home. And as we fill those seats, as God fills those seats, because not we're, we're not going to do it, as God fills those seats, we'll get more seats. But pray for those empty seats. Look around at who's not here. Pray for those. And as we're thinking about this, think about do we really believe, and I posed this question last week too, but it, this extends out to this chapter. Do we really believe that Jesus will one day return? Because if we do, we're going to live differently. Our, out, our mindset is going to be different. We're going to have more of an urgency because we know that his return is imminent. It's coming soon, and each day it's closer to that. And so do we really believe it? And If so, what should our response be and how should we live in light of the imminent return of Jesus? And so let's pray once again for our passage. God, we thank you that you are good and loving, that you are our way maker, you are our promise keeper, you're the miracle worker, you're the way in the darkness. And even when we can't see it, our eyes can be so deceived at different times. 
We can, we can be caught up in our circumstances. We can be caught up in so many different things. And even though we may see chaos, you see your plans moving forward. And so even when we can't see it, you're working. Even when we can't feel it, and we don't want to trust in our feelings, we want to trust in you, the promise keeper, and on your word. Even when we don't feel it, you're working. You never stop working. And so God, as we look into these scriptures here today, continue to expand our heart and understanding of you. Help us to see you a little bit more clearer and help us to follow you a little bit more closely. Help us to hear clearly the words that are being said, our hearts to be open to it and our bodies to move with it. Please anoint my lips so that it speaks forth your words, Lord, not my own. And may all be done to your purposes, to your glory, for the advancement of your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so let's look here. And so two things that we want to look at today as we're, as we're moving through this chapter are these two points. And the two points are, we're going to see, first of all, the good shepherd. And we'll see that in the first section of the little passage there in chapter uh, 10, verses 1 through 5. And then we're going to see, and I, I thought I liked this, because I thought Ryan would like this title of it or this, this little thing, Exodus Part 2, The Gathering. So I could see that as like being like a, you know, a movie title or something like that. So um, hopefully Ryan approves of that, but he'll probably tweak it a little bit because he, he likes to tweak things a little bit too. So, uh, but those are the two things that we're going to be looking at. So let's go ahead and start off here with verses 1 through 5. As we are in chapter 10, verse 1 through 5, and we read this. Restoration of Judah and Israel. Chapter 10, verse 1 says, Ask the Lord for rain. In the time of the latter rain, the Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. For the idols speak delusion. The diviners, the diviners envision lies and tell false dreams. They comfort in vain. Therefore, the people wend when they when, wend their way like sheep. They are in trouble because there is no shepherd. Verse 3, my anger is kindled against the shepherds, and I will punish the goat herders. For the Lord of hosts will visit his flock, the house of Judah, and will make them his, as his royal horse in the battle. From him comes the cornerstone. From him comes the tent peg. From him comes the battle bow. From him every ruler together. Verse 5, they shall be like mighty men who tread down their enemies in the mire of the streets in battle. They shall fight because the Lord is with them and the riders on the horses shall be put to shame. And so what do we have going on here? Well, we, we see this main thing here about the good shepherd, the one that's coming, the, that um, this, this idea is, is, is fleshed out there in verse 2, where it says that there's pe the people are not knowing where they're going. They're kind of wandering around. And why are they wandering? Because there is no shepherd. And God says, uh, my anger is kindled against the shepherds that are there because the shepherds that are there are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're not doing what they're called to be doing. And we don't want to be those shepherds. We want to be those shepherds that are doing what the Lord has called us to do and that we're caring for one another and leading forward. And so right here in verse 1, we hear of our response to all that we learned about last week in chapter 9. And what were the, some of the things that we learned about last week in chapter 9? We learned a whole bunch of promises and truths about who God is. We learned that God is sovereign. He is in control of all of it. And so we trust him in that. Even when our eyes see something different, we know that God is in control. He's sovereign. His plans and his purposes are working out. And so we go with that rather than our feelings, rather than our thoughts, rather than our eyes. We know that there's a certainty of judgment, that his, his judgment will come. Even though we see the wickedness all around us, it will come to an end one day. And even though it looks like people are getting off scot-free with things, they're not. There is a certainty of judgment, and we can hold that as a promise and a truth. We know that God defends his people. We know that he is a defender of those that are, are called according to his purposes, that he defends his people, that he is the one that's the great battle 
uh, that he's a warrior. That is his name. The Lord will save his people. He delivers them from their afflictions. He cares for his people, and God brings peace. He's the only one that can truly do that. And those are some of the things that we learned last week in chapter 9. And so what is our response and our role? Well, we see here in verse 1 and 2 that our response and our role is to have faith in what he said, to truly believe it, and to walk in active prayer before him as well. And where do we see that? Well, we see in verse 1 there, he says, ask the Lord for rain. So that's a, that asking is that prayer before the Lord, trusting God for who he is and what he says. Now, active prayer. Let's think about this active prayer, putting your trust in God for all of your needs and actively doing what God is calling us to do, not just sitting back passively, throwing up these prayers and then not doing anything about it. But how can you be an answer to prayer? How, what is God calling you to be? So there's the act of, of praying and talking to God, but there's also stepping forward in act of obedience before the Lord, doing what he's called us to do. Not just throwing up these prayers and then sitting back and not doing anything, just being passive in it. And we see this here in this verse. It says, ask the Lord for rain in the time of latter rain. The Lord will make flashing clouds. He will give them showers of rain, grass in the field for everyone. So we see this this idea of what God can do, and we can't do that, and what we need to do. So do your part. We ask the Lord for rain. We cannot bring rain. We can't bring that. But what we can do is we can work the ground. We can plant. We can weed. We can do what he's calling us to do, and so that those crops are there. We can sow the seed. We can be moving forward in that. As his spirit is leading us. I want you to hear what these two verses sound like in the New Living Translation. It says this. Ask the Lord for rain in the spring. For he makes the storm clouds. And he will send showers of rain. So every field becomes a lush pasture. Household gods give worthless advice. Fortune tellers predict only lies. The interpreters of dreams pronounce falsehood and they give no comfort. So my people are wandering around like lost sheep. They're attacked because they have no shepherd. And so there's things that God can only do. He's the only one that can bring rain. And the Israelites, they were very aware of this. They didn't have the irrigation systems that we have today. They couldn't just go out and turn on the sprinklers. They had to pray for the Lord. And we've been in drought here in in, uh, California. But how much more for them? They don't have the luxuries that we have. They were completely reliant upon God to bring that. And if the rain didn't come, there was no crops. They didn't have anything to eat. There was very, very real to them. And so for us, we ask God and we, we pray earnestly that God would do his part that he can do. And then we step forward in faith and we actively do what we are called to do. And we don't put our, our faith in false religion or false gods and idols. Psalm 115, 4 through 8 tells us this, their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. Eyes, but they do not see. They have ears, but they do not hear. Noses, but they do not smell. They have hands, but they do not feel. Feet, but they do not walk. And they do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. And these are what we have all around us. All these false idols, all these gods, all these things that we cry out for them to save us. And they can't. My job, save me. My finances, save me. This relationship, save me. This drug, save me. This lifestyle, save me. It doesn't. It can't. False idols. No voice in their throats. 
feet, but they can't walk, hands, but they can't do anything with them, worthless idols. And how much of the time do we put our faith in worthless idols and we trust in those worthless idols and we give everything to it and it gives nothing back to us? That is not our God. That is not our Lord. And yet all around us, there's people trusting in false idols, worshiping these false idols to save them. And what does it say? That they're like sheep without a shepherd. 1 Kings 22, 17 says, And he said, I saw all Israel scattered on the mountains as sheep having no shepherd. The Lord said, They have no master. Let each one return to his home in peace. Ezekiel 34, 5 says, So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. They became food for the wild beast. My sheep are scattered. And there's so many sheep out there that don't know that yet that they've been called by the Lord. And so we're out there going forth as his under shepherds saying, come, come to the Lord. He wants you. He's accepted you. He's given everything for you. Just come to Jesus in Matthew 9, 36. Jesus looking out on the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Yet we turn so much to other things and we hear and listen to these voices that give us bad, deceptive advice. We listen to these voices that tell us outright lies. I was listening to a song uh, yesterday and it really struck me and that song was by a band called Bad Omens and it's a, a band that is uh, very popular right now. They have a lot of songs that are on the radio. They have a lot of songs that are really reaching millions and millions of people and they have this song called Mercy and in that, uh, so I, I, I heard the title of it and I'm like, oh good, maybe there's some good things in here but here's the words of Mercy. Blinded by the fear of feeling, these are the kings that we chose. That's good. They're recognizing that, they're, that they have chosen bad kings, bad leaders, bad people to follow after. And they recognize also, this, and you're hearing the next part here, they recognize also their current state. We're dying every day. Tell me that it's not all in vain. Is it worth all the suffering? Is it worth the price that we paid? Is it worth it? But then here is their mantra to those around them. And here's what they think about God. You can give sight to the blind, but you can't force them to see. You could take us back in time, but it wouldn't change a thing. If God came down from his kingdom, he came down from his home, and, he asked, and we asked him if he'd take us back, he would surely tell us no. If God came down from his kingdom, he came down from his throne, and we asked him if he'd take us back, he would tell us we can't go. Heartbreaking. And outright lies. Outright lies. But this is what our world around us believes. Either God is distant and he doesn't care about us, there is no God, or if we ask him, no, he wants to crush us instead. Outright lies. But we know the truth. We know the one who is the good shepherd. And we read about that. You, I would encourage you read about that in chapter 10 of John. Go back today and read about that good shepherd. The people had listened to false and deceptive leaders, and, the one, and one of the reasons was that there was a lack of godly leadership, a lack of godly leadership. And so that's a call to us. We have terrible leaders all around us. We know that, right? We have people that are leading for selfish reasons. We have people that are leading for motives other than for the people that they serve. We have people that are leading and they do not know the Lord and there's, their leading is completely to, for their own self-gain and all to build up themselves, their own egos, whatever it might be. But for us in, he, in here, we need a call to godly leadership. We need to be encouraging each other day by day, building up leaders. And guess what? Each one of us is a leader. Each one of us is a pastor. 
Now, you may not be up here teaching like this, but each one of us has been given a sphere of influence that is unlike anybody else. Each one of us has been given a group of people around us, a congregation that is unlike anybody else. Your congregation is filled with some people that believe in Jesus already and some people that don't. And you are there as that pastor, as that under shepherd to give them the Lord. Because I've heard it said many times here and here and in other places, we may be the only Bible that somebody reads. We may be the only Jesus that somebody sees. We are little, Christian means little Jesus, little Christ. And that is our call to be that, to be that example, to be that hands and feet of the good shepherd himself. And in that passage in John 10 and here, we see that there's the good and the bad. There's the false and bad shepherds, the thieves, the robbers, the strangers, the hirelings. They all want what they can take. The good shepherd is all about what he can give. The bad shepherds try to steal the sheep. They deceive the sheep. The sheep flee, flee the stranger because it doesn't know their, they don't know his voice. The thief tries to steal, kill, and destroy. And the hirelings are just there because they're paid people. So they're substitute shepherds, but they don't care about the sheep. So when they're in danger, they run away, and we don't want to be any of those things. Ezekiel 34 verse 2 says, Woe to you shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not a shepherd care for the flock? And then in verse 4 it says, You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. Jesus, though, owns the sheep, cares for the sheep, loves the sheep, protects the sheep, feeds the sheep, and dies for the sheep. And that is our call to each one of those things. You as an under shepherd for the Lord with your own little sphere of influence, you're, what you are to be about is about bringing those sheep, helping to, the Lord to bring those sheep back to himself, the ones that he owns, that we would be those that hands and feet, we would help to care for them and love them, help to feed them and protect them, and that we would die to ourselves in order to lift up those others that need it so much. Verse 4 tells us here, From him comes the cornerstone, the tent peg, the battle bow. From him comes the ruler of all together. And these are all speaking of Jesus, the perfect shepherd who there is. God would raise up the perfect shepherd, the one who is the cornerstone, the tent peg, the battle bow, and the ruler over all rulers. The cornerstone, that he is the foundation. He is the measure. He is the standard. He is the perfection. And there is no other. The tent peg, that he is the one that holds everything together and that he holds it all securely. The battle bow, that he is a strong fighter for good and that he rules over all others. Jesus is the good shepherd, and he lays down his life for his sheep. Being a shepherd in Palestine was very dangerous. If the shepherd was killed, then the sheep would most likely lose their lives as well. In contrast, the good shepherd's death results in eternal life for his sheep. The thief takes away the life of the sheep. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. His sheep know him, and they listen to his voice. And this passage here is speaking forward to that great shepherd of Jesus. But it was also a word to the shepherds that were there. Hey, Christians, hey, believers, do what God has called you to do. Be people of faith who trust his promises and are active in your prayer that you're not just saying these words, but that you're moving forward and advancing the kingdom of God. That you're realizing that the godly leadership is needed and that each one of us has a sphere of influence. And so we see the good shepherd there in verses 1 through 5. And now let's look here in verses 6 through 12 to Exodus part 2, the gathering. 
And so starting in verse 6, it says this, I will strengthen the house of Judah and I will save the house of Joseph. I will bring them back because I have mercy on them. They shall be as though I had not cast them aside. And you hear all the things that God will do. He's saying, I will, I will, I will. And these are things that only God can do. But we will hear our part as well. But there's, these are things that only God can do. He's going to strengthen. He's going to save. He's going to bring people back. He's going to show mercy. He's going to be have it be as though they had never been cast aside. For I am their, Lord, their God, and I will hear them. Verse 7, those of Ephraim shall be like a mighty man, and their heart shall, be, shall rejoice as if, there were, if it was with wine. Yes, their children shall see it and be glad. Their heart shall rejoice in the Lord. I will whistle for them and gather them, for I will redeem them, and they, and they shall increase as once increased." I don't know if about you, but for me, growing up, my dad had this very distinct whistle. And it didn't, it didn't matter where we were, how far away we were. If he wanted to get our attention, he'd do this whistle. And we could hear it. It's very distinct. And we'd hear it and know. And we need to pray that the Lord whistles and that people hear it. And they recognize, that's my father. That's the, the one who's whistling that one loves me. That one's calling me. And whatever I'm doing in the murk and the mud, I hear the whistle and I run towards him. Verse 9, I will sow them among the peoples and they shall remember me in far countries. They, they shall live together with their children and they shall return. I will also bring them back from the land of Egypt and gather them from Assyria. I will bring them into the land of Gilead and Lebanon until no more room is found for them because there's so many people that he's gathered together. He shall pass through the sea with, the, with affliction and strike the waves of the sea. All the depths of the river shall dry up and the pride of Assyria shall be brought down and the scepter of Egypt shall depart. It doesn't matter how powerful you are. God's plans and his purposes will be done. And the, the things that people lift up as so powerful and important, they're nothing in light of who God is. Verse 12, And so I will strengthen them in the Lord, and they shall walk up and down in his name, says the Lord. And so we see here an Exodus part two, just like that story of Jesus or of, of God and uh, using Moses and Aaron to pe bring the people out of the land of Egypt. He's doing this now again. He's bringing them out of all of the slavery and sin of the world around them and gathering them together because Egypt is everywhere now. It's not just that central place being enslaved. But now our Egypt is here in Los Angeles. Egypt is in, around the world. It's all over. And God is calling people to himself. He's gathering the people, that second exodus, come out of the world. Come out of that Egypt. Come back to me. And so God will have mercy on his people. He sends them the perfect shepherd who will gather them, protect them, save them, and care for them. And once again, verses 20, chapter 23 of Jeremiah tells us about the woe that there is to shepherds who are not doing what they are called to do. He says this, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pastures, declares the Lord. And he set up all of these leaders in our world around us, and many of them are not following after him. And they're leading people either in farther astray, and they're leaving them down, leading them down terrible roads. But for us, we need to hear this as well. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people. You have scattered my flock and have driven them, them away, and you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and God, help us to be those shepherds. 
I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they, will sh- and they shall fear no more, nor be in dismay, neither shall they be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, and Israel will, be, will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Amen. And then in Isaiah 66, 7 through 8, um, we see how God has unfolded some of his plans and purposes that he's talked about here because he's not done with Israel as well. He's not done with his people Israel. He's drawing them back to himself as well. And he's got great plans and purposes for his people, Israel. And it says in Isaiah 66, verse 7 and 8, Before she was in labor, she gave birth. Before her pain came upon her, she, she delivered a son. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such a, a thing? Shall a land be born in a day? Shall a nascent nation be brought forth in a moment? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she brought forth her children. And on midnight, May 14th, 1948, the provisional government of Israel was proclaimed the state of Israel, new new state of Israel, a a state that hadn't been around for 2,000 years. That night became a state again. And the United States and the person of uh, President Truman being one of the, the most powerful countries on the, in the world at that time and still today, recognized the provincial Jewish government and said, yes, that is a state. And so God gave the people of Israel the, the land back. And there's been this gathering of the people of Israel that has happened there. And that's a partial fulfillment for what we see here. But God has a whole bunch of other people, too, that he's drawing to himself from every tribe, tongue, and nation. That he's gathering together. And that was his plan and his purpose from very, the very beginning. When he spoke that to Abraham in the very beginning, you will be a, you, I will bless you to be a blessing, Right? I will bless you to be a blessing. It wasn't that he hoarded the blessing all for himself, but that he was to be a blessing to all of the nations around. And so we're seeing part of that picture here. And we see this picture of the Exodus here and God's saving work. So Egypt is a picture of the bondage of sin. We have the Passover lamb, the picture of Jesus covering those who come under his blood and are saved from the wrath of God. And being brought out of Egypt and eventually into the promised land. And in John, going back to John, here's a couple more passages that I'd love for you guys to to be able to go back and read during this week. So you have John 10, the good shepherd. Now read chapters 6 through 8 of John as well. And you'll see three pictures here of Jesus and how Jesus is the, the savior of the Exodus. Three great statements about him. In John 6, 48 through 51, Jesus declares himself the bread of life. And it says, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes from heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give him for, for, life, for life is the word for the life of the world is my flesh. Sorry. Verse, uh, chapter seven, verses 37 through 39. So he says that he's the, the bread of life. And then in these verses, he declares himself to be the living water, to be the living water. And then that living water is the Holy Spirit. And so in John 7, 37 through 39, they're at this Feast of Tabernacles, and the Feast of Tabernacles was remembering God's provision in the wilderness as they wandered around the wilderness and looking forward to Messiah's reign. And it said, on the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit, 
whom those who believe in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So Jesus here makes this great statement about him being the bread of life, being the true manna. Manna was a picture of that bread from heaven, that provision of heaven. But the real true provision from heaven is Jesus, Jesus himself. Now in these verses that we just read, he says that the Spirit of God will be coming and it will indwell you. And it will be just like as we were wandering around the wilderness and the rock was struck and the water flowed out and you had water in this parched wilderness. Now you will have the Spirit of God, this living of water that will spring up into you, constantly springing up into you, giving that source of Jesus, that source of the Spirit through your life. And then in chapter 8, verse 12, he says that he is the light of the world. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And this is in reference to the cloud of fire and light that guided the Israelites through the desert. Jesus was showing himself to be the one that spoke to Moses in the burning bush. What did he say out of the burning bush? Who, who shall you say that I, that I am? Who shall I tell them that, that you are? Say, I am sent you. Say, I am that, you, that I am sent you. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying, I am that I am. I am the light of the world. I am the living water. I am the true bread of life. He's equating himself to that burning bush. He's equating himself to that voice of God. He's saying, I am very God of very God. Before Abraham was, I, I am. Jesus is declaring that. And so he gives himself as the bread for eternal life. He gives himself as the water for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And, in light, and the light. He is the good shepherd who lights and guides the way before us. Through these verses, we see all that God will do. Once again, reminding us of his promises. He will save us. He will gather us. He will be the one to bring us out of Egypt. He will bring the one, be the one to bring us out of our sinfulness. He'll destroy those that, that are, uh, the judgment will come upon those that are not following after him. And so what is our response? Our response is God's promises compel us to live out our calling. Richard Phillips wrote a commentary on this section, and he said this of these verses 6 through 12. He said, The passage begins with I will, but ends with they will. They shall walk in his name, declares the Lord, Zechariah 10, 12. The results of God's I will is the they will of his people. This is the way that salvation works. Those who are called will walk in the name and strength of the Lord because he wills that we, we should. Not in our own strength. We're not doing it in our own strength. We're walking out the things that he is giving us strength to do. The very power that raised Christ from the dead is at work within us. That spirit is in us. And that's what's helping us to work out and to walk out the things of God. What a glorious salvation this is. Because of the promise of a mighty God, those who trust in Christ may know the power and joy of a new life, a new hope, and a new strength, all to the glory of his name. And I just want to end today with the words of an old hymn. And this was written by someone named uh, Miss C.H. Morris in 1906. It's called, I've enlisted, in the, I've enlisted for Life in the Army of the Lord. I've enlisted for life in the army of the Lord. Though the fight may be long and the struggle fierce and hard, with the armor of God and the Spirit's trusty sword, at the front of the battle you will find me. With the banner of love and of holiness unfurled, full salvation proclaimed to a sinful dying world, Though the darts thick and fast from the enemy be hurled, at the front of the battle you will find me. In your name, friend, enrolled, is your name, friend, enrolled with the loyal, loyal ones and true? Will you dare now to stand with the Savior's faithful few? Will you join with me now and the covenant renew? At the front of the battle you will find me. I'm in this, this army, this glorious army, 
and the God of all battles will defend me. He's the one that does it. I'm in this army, this glorious army. At the front of the battle, you will find me. Brothers and sisters, let's take God at his word. Let's listen to all of his I wills. And let's walk it out in our they will of walking out the things that God has for us. Walking out our calling. He is the good shepherd. But let's be good shepherds to those around us. He is the one who draws all out of the the countries around. But we're looking around and praying for those that aren't here. And we're as though God was yelling through us, be reconciled to God. Be his ambassador. Be those with me at the front of the battle. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your goodness upon us. Thank you that you are our good, true shepherd. Help us to listen to your voice, to follow closely after you, God. Thank you for calling people from every tribe, tongue, and nation to yourself. What a glorious, glorious eternity it will be. But help us now and here to take all of your I wills and to take those as promises and trust them. To be people who have absolute faith in you and are active in our prayers where we pray before you and we step out in advancing your kingdom. God, help us all to be at the front of the battle. We have been enlisted for life in your army, God. We thank you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.